there are not very many teams in the Big Ten that could match Ohio State for firepower, talent, perhaps hype this year. One exception, the Oregon Ducks. We're going to be talking about them today with James Crepia of the Oregonian. James, thank you for joining me. This is the first year of Big Ten football for Oregon. I guess, first, how different is this going to be? Is this an, a thing that people are grading with excitement? Are the Duck fans expecting to come in and just dominate the league? What, what's the mindset of Oregon fans coming into the season? Uh, all of the above. Mm-hmm. Uh, excitement, yes, first and foremost, because uh, I, I think the sheer jubilation that uh, Oregon fans will never have to worry about the Pac-12 network ever again uh, and having to explain to anybody where to find uh, what they're watching now. They do. Everyone has to learn on Peacock, and I'm not knocking them, uh, but that, the, the online streaming uh, future uh, that uh, you know is just part, of, part and parcel to anybody right now, uh, that'll be a new thing. Uh, and I think they're going to be experiencing that in a non-conference game with Boise State, uh, if memory serves me correctly. So uh, there'll, there'll be there'll be a little bit of that. Yeah. There'll be a little bit of, of uh, I wouldn't even call it growing pains, but just some of the adjustments to uh, this new world order and not just in conference play, uh, but a lot of it in the broadcast realm. But that's called what it is. That's why the move was had, and that's why the move is always going to be had. Uh, whether it happened, you know, whether the Pac-12 had managed to stick together, which happened. Uh, but if it did, uh, it was always an eventuality. This was always going to happen eventually. Uh, and then, obviously, the way things went for all last summer uh, it just got us all here, greater ecosystem supporting it. But are fans excited? Uh, yes, absolutely. For the exposure, for the bigger games, uh, for whether it's home games, road games, whatever. I'm talking about the Ohio State home game, frankly, is you know, four plus years overdue for, mm-hmm. for Oregon fans' perspective uh, because of the COVID year. It does, you know, it was. It was that was part of what was to be probably the greatest home schedule in program history. Uh, that never happened. <laughs> Oregon was supposed to host uh, North Dakota State uh, and Ohio State, uh, you know, to open that season, and uh, and it all disappeared uh, and, and was gone. So, bottom line, you know, they're getting that game and see from the ticket prices that they put out there at the time exactly how how much they expect from that. Uh, and now they're putting to, just today, uh, recording this, uh, Oregon putting uh, standing room only tickets uh, mm-hmm. available. Uh, to really absolutely pack <laughs> hots into the utmost and fullest that the fire marshal will permit. So, uh, yeah, they're excited for the huge games, they're excited for trips to Ann Arbor, they're excited for trips to Madison. Uh, I'm not sure how many of them are going to be thrilled for West Lafayette on a Friday night, uh, necessarily in October, but but that is part of it. You know, that said, you know, how many of them are making weirdo trips, whether it be to Pullman or, or Tucson mm-hmm. on a weird night? Kind of thing. So, bottom line, are they excited? Yes. They also have all of the high expectations that this team, this program that has been built, uh, and this foundation that was set by Crystal Ball, and then obviously enhanced and furthered by Lanning and this staff, to where now they feel like this is absolutely every bit of a preseason top and top five caliber team. We'll see from the AP polls and the coaches polls when they come out, but ultimately that they have the expectation that they should be there and will be there, and that this is a playoff team, and anything short of that would be just grossly disappointing for this season, and, and not just being a playoff team, but doing damage once you're there. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I and I, <laughs> and I think there's a lot of merit to back that up. Uh, depending whether you go by recruiting rankings, transfer rankings, uh, returning talent, any number of things, this is a really talented football team uh, across the board in the areas that they were weak, whether it be last season, two seasons ago, uh, you know, structurally within a particular position room, they've gone about addressing it. So there's really just not a lot of layering weaknesses anywhere on this roster, uh, and they went out. That again, credit to Dan and his staff to be able to build it uh, both in the recruiting realm and in the transfer portal to where they can feel that way going into the first season in this conference, going up against the likes of Ohio State the way they're built, and Michigan coming off a national title, and Penn State being a perennially top good te- you know, top end team. Look, call what it is, in, in yesteryear, this, this team, this program could have taken it on a lighter scale, not that they would have, but they could have gotten away with it in the Pac-12. If you were going to come in here and damage 2024, you had to be you got to be fully armed, and they feel like they're fully armed. Yeah, and you know they they were they have really rebuilt the team. You look, and it's like, oh boy, they lost so and so, they lost so and so. You know, and it's like, oh, they plugged that hole. Mm-hmm. You know, either through recruiting or you know bringing up a, a highly touted how to recruit, or you know, hey, they filled a lot of holes through the portal. They brought in not one but two highly touted quarterbacks through the portal. Probably the top two. Yeah, uh, Dylan Gabriel two. out of Oklahoma, uh, and and Dante Moore out of UCLA. Both names that you know I think Ohio State fans are kind of eyeing in the portal a little bit at the same time. They have been very impressive in roster building. And I know mm-hmm. anywhere online, 
you know, when your school gets a recruit, it's because of obviously they love it, everything about it. They love the academics. The Tom, academics. Sure, it's the academics. It's the, yes, it's the family it's atmosphere. Oh, that's a given. And when anyone else gets a recruit, money. They're dropping bags. Obviously, with we know. And and in in Oregon's case, everyone sort of points the finger at Phil Knight. Phil Knight is dropping bags, and it's because Phil Knight is eighty one or however old he is, Six. and eighty six, and he just wants to see Oregon win. Is that you know is is that you know, everyone is dropping bags to certain degrees in football now. NIL is a thing nationally. That is a thing you can do now legally. Is is there validity to the Phil Knight thing? Or is that just kind of, you know, he's the, the sort of, you know, the boogeyman that everyone knows. And so therefore it must be. Yes. I mean, Phil Knight is highly, in, and, and Phil and Penny Knight are highly invested in the University of Oregon mm-hmm. in all walks of life. Mm-hmm. They've built most all of the campus at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, continue to build. There's a new science uh, uh buildings and structure and part, like a whole science campus that keeps being built so for those who do make the trip to eugene if they actually set foot on the academic side of the river um they'll see uh exactly how palatial some of these facilities are with a quarter billion dollar track facility uh, a couple of years ago that's only hosted world championships and ncaa championships and every which other event you can come up with so they're highly invested in the university at large and yes the athletic department as well you know also give money to stanford you know, it's amazing. I haven't heard a lot about great conspiracies mm-hmm. that Phil and Penny are are funding mm-hmm. the Stanford NIL program. Yeah, you know, it's amazing how I just I haven't I haven't heard that conspiracy. Uh, look, are they invested? Yes. You know what? I don't hear a lot of Oregon fans claiming that Les Wessner and the Schottensteins and mm-hmm. that you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't hear them going. You know, they're only going to Columbus because oh no, oh, because Columbus they've, mm-hmm. they've been good since Trestle arrived and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So for the, so for most people's lifetimes, mm-hmm. they've been as excellent as they've been yeah i i understand yeah i know but like you said not for nothing boost has always been a thing mm-hmm. how and what they gave and to what end they gave was always a thing in smu's era and mm-hmm. in the sec bygone era of the mm-hmm. sec uh, mm-hmm. and even at times in the hot bygone era of the sec there are lots of people dropping off all kinds of money um auburn had a payroll mm-hmm. you know went bowed and got over there it's legal yeah yep move on mm-hmm. yes Oh, was that only because? Really, if that's the only reason. No, not for nothing. If that was the only reason, then what? They, they haven't lost anybody of uber consequence. They haven't lost some like, preeminent starter to another school. Because, so what? They, they've just managed to outfit. By the way, as good as this recruiting class is, and it could be historic yet again for Oregon's purposes, do they have like 15 or 25 stars that I'm unaware of? So it's, for, it's, it's good, but it's not. So for all yeah. of this conjecture yeah. about unlimited NIL, according to Rick Neuheis, what I actually talked about earlier, mm-hmm. uh, that comment mm-hmm. to him about that earlier, um, and about, you know, Phil's just doing this for anybody's boosters, doing it for whatever their mm-hmm. motivations are. Again, it's totally legal. Two, and I'm not Phil if any like, spokesperson. Yeah, certainly. Uh, but, and like, whether it's the Ohio State fan base or any other fan base, why 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 is anybody crying pauper mm-hmm. uh, from from the perspective of like, I think the way Dan Lanning's put it uh, recently, and we'll hear from him here uh, tomorrow, that uh, you know sometimes like all things like when people people who are in power and people who had control of a situation, and they suddenly see somebody else maybe mm-hmm. come to the table fully armed, uh, they don't tend to like that very much. Mm-hmm. You know what? Not for nothing. Alabama was great historically, mm-hmm. tremendous. Mm-hmm. They were obviously tremendous under Nick Saban. Well, there's a little bit of a dark era in there in terms of you know, a, a lull of success. Mm-hmm. It's not a birthright to just be. You know, don't, don't get too comfortable with success just because you had a coach or a string of coaches to have it. Oregon's built it over the last generation, and they've sustained it. And they've had boosters to do it, and Phil's at the top of the list, but he isn't. And like I say, an Oregon isn't the only school they give to, but yet it's the only one that gets tagged with this particular thing. So like I say, it's fun. It's part of college sport. I hear you. But guess what? One, who cares? Mm. Uh, in the grand scheme. Two, it's, well, now it's fully legal. Like, what does it make a difference? Yeah, right. And two, I, again, I, you never hear this in the NFL because, wow, there's a salary cap. What is mm. that? So what, like, did every free agent go to only the biggest cities or whatever? You feel like their motivations, whatever they are. But like I guess say, if it's just about that, and but but they don't otherwise develop players, they don't otherwise just send a record number of players to the NFL for the program's purposes. They didn't also, uh, like I say, retain talent. So if somebody was just just got paid, but then got highly jaded about something, they've managed to not lose anybody. It's like it has to like sooner or later, like 
If yep. that was the only thing, if that was the only crutch, if that was everything that there was no substance to it whatsoever, one, they wouldn't be having success on the field. Two, they wouldn't be sending guys to the NFL. And three, they'd be losing guys somewhere along the lines because if it was just about that, but it wasn't about playing and development, then they weren't following through. They're hitting on all cylinders with it. And they, they feel like they can go certainly beyond and aspire for national championships also. But I say that criticism to me is not so much whether it's valid or invalid. It's just hate it. It's mm-hmm. anthem. Um, again, I, I, I've yet to find a single school who didn't get a particularly good amount of mm-hmm. booster money in the last yeah. uh, 10 to 15 years. Yeah, so. that, that's uh, yeah. I don't know. Ohio State fans bristle with the idea that they have bought their roster this year. And no, it's, yeah, yeah. No, so yeah, so it's never, uh, yeah, never. Yeah, it's uh, no. <laughs> you kidding? It's uh, no, it, it, it multiple is, transfers that came in from yeah. No. It is it is a fun fun time for everyone to point fingers at each other and say you're doing it's part it. of the fun of college. Yes, college. exactly, part exactly. Of so talking about this year's Oregon team to me is a little bit like talking about this year's Ohio State, where you know we can sit here and talk about the you know oh here's for either team. Oh, you know, they're so talented in this area. They're so talented. Mm-hmm. And it turns into the Chris Farley, Paul Cartney sketch where it's like, remember, you know, you know, all those, the quarterbacks they've got, yeah, they're pretty awesome. It's almost more interesting to me to talk about the other side of this for both of you. What are areas where there's sort of a little bit of a question right now? for Because it feels like they've, they've checked a lot of boxes in terms of yeah. returning players, in terms of yeah. transfer additions. What are, you know, what are the areas where there's they're going into fall camp kind of not sure or a little uneasy about something on either side of the ball? So the first, uh, first and foremost, it has to be about pass rush because two seasons ago it was basically not existing, um, and last season massively really not even where I should go. Uh, but when you talk about the losses, losses to the NFL uh, specifically, which they knew. They had it. They had the oldest defensive line room in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there were three or four players who had children. They, they were, <laughs> and and not just like newborns, like three year olds, like twenty <laughs> six year old men on this defensive line. Um, yeah, they're, they're all gone. Uh, so you're going from the oldest defensive line in the country to probably one of the youngest. Um, now that doesn't mean they're not ready or they're not prepared or what. They're not fully proven. Um, do they feel really good about the guys that they have there? Yes. Do they have Jordan Birch, who, for my money, is massive. Massive. Um, because, in part, because it was the back end. Because, in part, because, uh, not to say that he was inconsistent, but um, I would say it was less about a consistency issue and more about, in the games where he performed best, uh, including against some really, really good competition, Oregon State specifically last mm-hmm. season, he played a first-round offensive tackle and absolutely destroyed him. Destroyed him. I mean, it just crushed him. If he puts forth that every single week this season, and we talked about it with the spring, like if he did that every week this season, he'd be top ten caliber draft. Pick. That that's the caliber of player he is. Right now, I don't think most people in this league have a clue who Jordan Birch is on other teams, mm-hmm. uh, other than the four West Coast schools, you know, because a couple of them played him. You know, SEC schools know because he played at South Carolina before that. But truly, like I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot of offensive tackles who are on Oregon's schedule outside of Washington. Um, and, and perhaps UCLA, just because they may be heard of the distance. I don't think there's too many who know of them. Uh, they should, <laughs> and they're going to. <laughs> they will, yeah. They will, um, because, yeah, he is just an absolute wrecking ball. He's at the top of the list. But after that, you're dealing with a lot of sophomores, rising sophomores who played a lot as freshmen, were productive in their roles as freshmen, but now are going to be in starting roles or heavy rotation roles. That's where I say pass rush has to be the top question, because as massive a player as he was, he was. He went down early in the Pac-12 title game last year. You saw, oh, well, how did, how did Washington's offensive line then go from there? Yes, again, still a pretty deep interior defensive line, but in terms of the edge and edge rush presence, you had one game record. He went down, like, well, uh, six or eight plays in the game or something. It was on the opening drive. And that was it. Mm. And that was it. He took a, a grown human out of the equation, and just you had young guys who just didn't have, didn't have that. Up against that particular Washington this year, so that's part of it. That would be the first theory. Secondly, um, I have less concerns about the secondary than ever before, uh, at least in two years under Dan, and, and really going back to probably since the ninth season where they had more, uh, draft picks in the secondary. They brought in preeminent corners to, to address the number one weakness that they had. I think it's more about just making sure that all the pieces that you brought in that everything fits correctly. 
but, but I think they'll be able to sort that out before they get into the Big Ten play, to be quite honest. So it's not really a question. The other part, um, and this is really starting to get nitpicky, but, you know, it's just not the sugar coat. And, and I haven't all, you know, all off season from the spring in particular was, look, they lost the Remington Trophy winner at center. And, you know, on one hand, people look at it and go, like, it's, the, it's one of the easiest positions, and one of the lower value positions in the league, and all these sorts of things. Listen, you know, there's only two guys who touch the ball every play on offense. And uh, if, if you're not getting the snap down, Something's, you know, and, and Oregon's changing both of them. And one's this, who's now taken over as a six-year quarterback. So if there's problems with the snap from a now sophomore center who admitted and played in the bowl game, played well, frankly, but who admitted heading into the bowl game, he didn't play center in high school, that learning the snap and getting used to it was a challenge for him and was a task for him. And it was a little bit inconsistent in the bowl game, but it didn't matter because they were playing Liberty. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in the spring, and then the spring game, we saw bad snaps, mm-hmm. several. Now it's a spring game; it's not make more of it, but it's, it's what we have by way of a sample size. And you have a player acknowledging like this is a weakness of his, and mm-hmm. something he's working on. And then in the last practice that you see, the 14th to 15th, they have one more after the spring game. Uh, the results weren't very good. Well, yeah, you gotta get that down. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't have it be like, oh, we're still going to figure this out against Idaho, and then Boise State is probably the number one G5 team in the country. You don't have time to figure this. So that's got to get settled. Like, and I uh, talked to Bill and Gabriel earlier this offseason. We'll talk to him here again tomorrow about, you know, ironing that down. And they feel like that he feels a lot more confident today working with Ipani Lalu Poncho for nickname purposes. For, for fans <laughs> of hearing this, you're going to hear Poncho reference a lot. It's, it's Ipani. Um, they feel a lot better about it. But like I say, it's 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 an urgent matter in that again, like if this if we were talking about one of the guard positions, I wouldn't even mention it. Yeah. Because he has to touch the ball every play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta <laughs> mention, like, yeah, the snap has to it has to be there. Yeah. Otherwise now now you're putting out a fire mm-hmm. uh, if it if it isn't addressed. So defensively, the far more substantive pass rush, less who we know the who, but how they go about making the production possible from a defensive goal, including several guys in the league now. Uh, drafted and undrafted, and offensively, just getting Christmas because of such a well oiled machine. They have so many skill position weapons, arguably even more than a year ago. Yeah, but the skill positions don't matter if falling in there on time, everything hitting correctly. <laughs> plenty of time to iron it all out before the season starts, plenty of time to iron it all before the biggest games, but you don't want to suddenly be sorting out whether or not your center is your center. In the middle of September, yeah, you want to get that done. And feel great about it mm-hmm. by like the second scrimmage of fall camp. Like mm-hmm. you want it done. You don't want no quibbling. You you don't want me talking about this. Yeah, yeah. When we talk in October, <laughs> you don't want me. You know, if you're Oregon, you don't want me mentioning this whatsoever. So. Uh, you mentioned this earlier that you know ex- expectation is you're going to make the playoffs. Like, it would take something significantly going wrong to make yeah. it, not make the playoffs. Yeah. What does what constitutes success? Is it just make the playoffs? Is it get to the semifinals? Is it? I mean, Ohio, the the phrase that keeps getting thrown around in Columbus this year is "natty your butt." Now, is that is that the attitude in in Eugene, or is it not? You know, if they make the playoffs and they win a game, and you know, you get to the quarterfinals or the semifinals, is that going to be viewed as a successful season? What what does success look like? So, I, I again, I certainly don't speak for the fans or fan base at all. So, I'm sure there's some. Highly delusional uh, member of the fan base that feels it's natty or bust out there. I'm sure you could find them uh, out there in the Twitterverse somewhere. But no, I mean, I, I don't know how anybody, I don't know how any fan of a program who hasn't won a national championship can take the premise <laughs> of natty or bust. That's that's uh, that that's utterly preposterous to me. Um, but playoff or, or bust for sure. Um, I think that. There's a significant portion of the fan base that you certainly hear from that feels that this is a team who not only can and will and should make the playoff, but um, that can and should compete for and, and play for the Big Ten Championship and come back here and be back in this building in December, whether it be against Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, or whoever uh, emerges, um, that they should be one of the teams playing here. And if they make it to here and have had a 10, 11, 12 win season to that point before that, Frankly, at that point, of course, every any, anybody who has a team, a fan of a team who plays for a, a conference title, uh, 
wants to win the game, and then therefore, you know, anything less than is. But but ultimately, in order to be a top four seed, you got to win this. But if you if you go eleven and one, but lose this, and you're eleven and two, but you're the five or the six seed, and you're hosting a playoff game. Is that what not successful? Thank you. you know, you got to you got to be a little bit fair. I mean, call it what it is. If Ohio State for, you know, flip the table. If if Oregon and Ohio State play twice this season and, and even split it, but Ohio State's on the losing end of this. It has to host a playoff game, but wins the playoff game and wins and goes to a semi at least. What are we going to not call that success? I mean, you know, that, that's where I say like there's things along the way. So for me, for what I've heard, for what I'm picking up on from fans and like, Natty or Bus seems uh, like say, pretty preposterous. Uh, playoff or Bus certainly uh, expectation of playing for and certainly buying for being in the mix for a conference title all the way to the very end. Absolutely, uh, hopefully to win it. Certainly, and they get a top four seed, and all things come with it. I think a lot of the Oregon fans expect not just to make the playoff, though, but to, or if they have to play in a quarterfinal game, and so be it. But I think a lot of them hope and expect to be in no less than a semi. I don't know, again, I don't know for this fan base how many can really truly objectively say, man, they must play mm-hmm. for the national championship. I mean, aspire for it and want it, want it, you know, desire, like, no, nobody's business. Absolutely. But to, to say like anything less than that would be a failure, I, I I don't know about that. Um, again, getting in, winning at least one game, whether that's being a quarterfinal if you have to play in it, or uh, or, or first round, excuse me, before the quarterfinal. Um, yeah, but but to demand, like I say, to demand making it to the national championship for for a program that hasn't won one, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, little, objectively little, speaking, rich. Yeah, no matter, rich, yeah, yeah. whether we're talking about Oregon or anybody, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't care what program. I, that, yeah. That's that's neither here nor there. I would say that about any number of SEC schools. They felt that way. It just, it, I mean, you, you have to have a degree of, of perspective of rationality. Yeah, this is this is a sort of a variation of something I've said for years. You never pick a team; you go undefeated. So many things that go wrong, and one one game, one thing goes wrong, and it's over. Yeah. So, uh, get you out of here on this one for Ohio State fans visiting Eugene. Been a long time since Ohio State has played out in Eugene. Yeah. Anything uh, areas around the stadium where you definitely sit here or try to avoid sitting here, or places to go around town that are you know any any travel tips for Ohio State fans who are making the trip? Uh, if you can manage to fly into Eugene, I highly recommend it. Okay. Um, if you have to fly to Portland, so be it. I understand. I, I get it. There's been undoubtedly be more flight options. Mm-hmm. To, uh, I was hoping that United Airlines was going to do what it usually did and add the, the random direct flight thing, which they added three oh, yeah. years ago for us uh, hmm. fly from uh, from Eugene to Columbus, hmm. uh, which was lovely. That was that was fantastic. <laughs> uh, as one of the people on the return trip uh, back, uh, from there, that was that was absolutely fantastic. I was hoping they were going to do that. I, you know, the summer is still young. I suppose that yeah. can still come yeah. along in August, but uh, I realized that most of the logistics are pretty much locked up. I'm sure hotels are long since completely got gobbled up. Um, Sitting in the stadium wise, um, so understand that the field runs east to west uh, rather than north to south. So uh, it certainly looks like this is expected to be an, a night game. And I say it looks like and expected because, well, one, I was talking to some people from TV where it works and nothing's we, finalized. We, but we've been talking a lot about of that people, on our show is about that a lot of almost people, certainly be an NBC cer- night game. Yes, a yeah. lot of people certainly sound that way. And Oregon put out today with the standing room only tickets to wear black, so it's going to be the blackout jerseys mm-hmm. and whatnot, the new black jerseys. Um, so it's like, well, if they're going to do that, I don't think you do that in the you know, noon Pacific yeah. time. I, mm-hmm. I have a feeling they're going to be doing that in the evening, so therefore, yes. It, but be that as long well as uh, Don't worry about like when the sun sets. You don't have mm-hmm. to worry about sun shining or anything out kind of that. The newer video board, it's now a couple of years old, uh, is on the east side of the stadium, so if you're somebody who they have one on the west side, it's just it's a bit smaller. If you're somebody who likes to see that from within a viewing experience of in the stadium. No one recognized that the giant video boards on the east side. So if you're, you have a ticket on the east side, you're going to be kind of you know, yeah. freaking your neck a little bit differently than west or whatever. Um, no, otherwise, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want, the, the overhang is on the south side as opposed to the north side. Um, but no, truly from a, a seating experience, it's, it's a bowl that's set up the way it is where I don't think bad seats in the entire building, quite honest. I think there's like one or two that have that like crazy obstructed view kind of deal, mm-hmm. but like they're way, way, way off of crooks of corners that it's pretty obvious you're in a, mm-hmm. you're in a tough spot. Uh, short of that, 
Uh, no, otherwise, uh, spots in Eugene and the like. Uh, there's uh, unfortunately a couple of spots have actually closed relatively recently, but um, there's there's a district in downtown called uh, commonly referred to as the Barmuda Triangle. Oh. So for those who wish to partake or those who are fortunate enough to be staying in one of the downtown hotels like the Graduate uh, or the Gordon or, um, gosh, I want to say there's one of the brothers, but bottom line, uh, that are perfect walking distance from those mm-hmm. establishments. Uh, I won't uh, give my ringing endorsement to any one or the other. <laughs> there are many. You will find them all. It's a very easy place to kind of bar hop around in. Um, it is not like a Nashville or Vegas with an open container kind of premise or anything like that, but it's uh, awfully close. Um, and, and pretty well monitored, but uh, but no. Bottom line, like it, it's a fun town for to go to for a weekend for a ball game kind of deal, and uh, and certainly be a part of it. And I know, yes, obviously, Ohio State fans look forward to it, and Oregon fans look forward to uh, to welcoming them mm-hmm. uh, and having that caliber of opponent and that caliber of a game. That's going to be uh, obviously what you certainly can expect to be an all day uh, fiasco mm-hmm. with it being <laughs> certainly looking like it's going to be an evening game. So should be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it, but uh, yeah, in terms of general setting and the like. I uh, would certainly recommend also for those to, who, who, who have to, even if you come in from Portland that day, not and get it, not only get in early for tailgating or for parking or mulling about purposes, but you have the day to mill about and walk around and see the campus and stuff. Uh, like, if it's, if it's at your disposal, go ahead and do it. Yeah. Um, it, it really is something to, to experience and see. And it's like, like, like anywhere, but mm-hmm. a, a trip that, you know, fan, no matter what happens in this year, Whenever the next visit is, obviously fans look forward to that one, but it comes up again too. Yeah, but it's one, not one you're doing literally every year. Yeah. Uh, so make the most of the trip when you can, and, and just as many Oregon fans who made the trip to Columbus in 21 did, um, yeah, try to make the most of it. Really. Well, looking forward to that. Thank you for uh, joining me, and uh, we'll see you in uh, October. Yes, sir.